We are gathered here today to receive comfort and consolation and compassion from Christ. And we're here to celebrate and pay respects to the life of Audrey Stecker. And as we gather together to reach out to the Lord for love and support and strength, let us begin by bowing our heads with prayer. Father, we are grateful that we can be here to celebrate Audrey's life. We thank you for her life. She was such a wonderful mom and mother-in-law and grandma and great-grandma. And she loved Jesus and she served the Lord. And she's an inspiration to us. And I ask that as we have our worship service that you would deal graciously with all those who mourn that casting their cares on you, they would experience in profound ways your care for them. In Jesus' name, amen. Our first scripture selection is the 23rd Psalm. David was responsible for 73 out of the 150 Psalms, and he was a shepherd of sheep before he became the shepherd of God's people, Israel. And he calls upon that background for imagery as he speaks of the Lord in the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Our next reading comes from the 84th Psalm, which was not one of the 73 Psalms written by David, but it's a powerful depiction of the glories of being with God in his house in heaven. Picking up the action in Psalm 84, verse 10, it says, Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. O Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. And our next reading comes from the book Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Solomon is describing his odyssey, how he has to make a lot of mistakes and go through a lot of difficult situations in his life before he realizes that the main purpose of life is not to have fun and party, although enjoying life is one of the gifts of God. The main purpose of life is to fear God and keep His commandments because that is the whole duty of man. Why? Because God will bring every deed into judgment, whether good or bad. And in Ecclesiastes 3, Solomon is still working out his doctrine of God. And this is what he says, there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones, a time to gather them, a time to embrace and a time to refrain a time to search and a time to keep, a, a give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent, a time to speak, a time for love and a time for hate, a time for war and a time for peace. The Word of the Lord. At this time, all who are able are invited to stand and we will sing, what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see.
Amen. And thank you. You may be seated. <clears throat> Our next selection of readings move us into the New Testament. John chapter 14. The main theme of John's Gospel is so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. John chapter 13, Jesus says, I'm going away, and where I go, you cannot come, but you will come later. And the disciples are upset. They're thinking, are we never going to see Jesus again? Is he abandoning us? Is he going to leave us here to rot on this rock? What in the world's going on? And so Jesus issues these words of comfort, beginning in the 14th chapter of St. John's Gospel. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Our next reading comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It's a particularly important document. This is one of the first primary source documents of the New Testament. Perhaps James was written first in 43 AD. Maybe Galatians in 48 or 49 AD. And we have good reasons to believe 1 Thessalonians was next, around 50 A.D. And one of the things that they're trying to work out theologically in the early church is what happens to a believer when they pass away. Does this mean we're never going to see him again? Does this mean we've lost all hope? And so Paul writes these wonderful words of encouragement in our text in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 13. He says, we do not want you to be unaware of those who, who are grieving like the rest of men and women who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we also believe that God will bring back with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we who are still alive and are left will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Our next reading takes us to the closing book of the Bible. Revelation chapter 21. The Apostle John gives us a beautiful image of the new heaven and the new earth. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear. From their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Behold, I am making everything new, says the Lord. And our next reading is special because it summarizes the entire Bible in one verse. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. This is the inspired, authoritative, 
infallible, inerrant word of God. And may the Lord add his blessing to the reading of the word and the reflection upon the word. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Lord, I am so grateful that, that we can have this time with you as we remember dear, beautiful Audrey's life. And I pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be faithful to your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Karl Barth was considered by many to be one of the greatest Christian theologians of the 20th century, century representing, of course, neo-Orthodoxy. We're evangelical, but we still recognize his contributions to theology. He wrote a 14-volume discourse on church dogmatics totaling 9,000 pages. He wrote commentaries on Romans and Galatians. He wrote countless essays. The man was brilliant. Near the end of his life, he was being interviewed, and somebody said to him, what is the most profound theological thought you have ever had? And Karl Barth said, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. The most significant and satisfying thing you could ever know is that Jesus loves you. Audrey Stecker knew that Jesus Christ loved her. Growing up in Stockbridge, going to Hilbert High School, getting confirmed, she knew that Jesus loved her. Getting married, raising a family, teaching her kids to love the Lord and serve the Lord and be active for the Lord in the context of congregational life. She had a sense of the presence and power and love of God. And even the last Sunday, she was here in church, sitting in the back row by the sound booth. She said with me out loud the last words of the sermon, Jesus loves you, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. The Bible tells us so in John chapter 3. In the first 15 verses, Jesus says, you must be born again. You must be transformed by the power of God through faith in Jesus Christ so that you live a totally new life for Christ rather than for yourself. And verse 16 tells us why we should be born again. Because God so loved the world, He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. First thing I want you to notice is the source of love. Love comes from God. He's the foundation of love, the origin of love. He Himself is love and the giver of true, authentic love. One time we were having Christmas pageant practice here, and a little kid was running down the aisle, and he tripped and fell, and he started crying. And I thought, oh boy, I guess I better help him. And as I was going over there, he got up all by himself and ran to his father. And somebody said, see, Pastor, you don't have to do anything. He's with his father now. Even though he was only four years old, he knew where to go for support. He knew where to go for strength. He knew where to go to experience love and affirmation and grace. We need to do the same thing today. We need to go to the source. We need to go to God for grace and strength as we mourn and at the same time as we celebrate Audrey's life. Second thing I want you to notice is the intensity of the love. It says, for God so loved the world. That word so is a marker describing in passion and intensity and fervor, an intense kind of love. And we see the word also in 1 John 4, verse 11, where it says, since God so loved us, so we also ought to love one another. And we use the word so in that context in conversations today. You may have heard somebody say, we're going to be going to Cobblestone Creek afterwards to have lunch as we continue to reflect on Audrey's life. And you may have heard somebody say, I love the roasted chicken at Cobblestone Creek so much. Or 
somebody says, we're going to go to Grandpa Stecker's house this weekend and see how he's doing. Oh, I love Grandpa Stecker so much. Or Pastor Mark's taking the youth group up to Titletown to go sledding and tubing this weekend. Oh, that's awesome. I love Pastor Mark so much. <laughs> it's just two little letters, but that word conveys so much force and power and punch. Next thing I want you to notice is the unconditional nature of the love. It says the word love is agape, which refers to unconditional affection with no strings attached. God was not strong-armed into loving you. He didn't say, oh, I guess I got no choice. I guess I got to love that guy. He chose to love you. He wants to love you. And did you know this? He loves you even though you're not perfect. How do I know that? Romans 5, 8 says God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus loves us even though we have sinned. Jesus loves us even though we have fallen short. Even if you are rebelling against God and rebelling against your parents and the very destiny of your soul is hanging in the balance at this moment, you need to know that God still loves you. If you call yourself a Christian, but you've been struggling with the same sin over and over and over again, you need to know that through it all, God still loves you. Even if you haven't yet received Jesus Christ as Lord of your life, He still loves you. Jeremiah 31.3, I've loved you with an everlasting love. Ephesians 2.4, because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. The next thing I want you to notice is the object of his love. God so loved the world. This is an interesting discussion in theological circles. Some people say that the word world doesn't literally mean everybody in the world. It means the world of the elect, the world of the select, the world of those who were unconditionally predestined before the beginning of time. That's what God means when he says he so loved the world. I've thought a lot about this. I, to me, that's packing a little too much dogmatic theology into one word. I think when God says he so loved the world, he meant the whole wide world. He meant us. He meant everybody. Jesus Christ's de death is sufficient for all, but efficient for all who believe. The next thing I want you to notice is the proof of God's love. He didn't just talk about how much he loved us. He didn't prognosticate about it. He didn't prophesy about it. He proved it by giving us his very best. He gave us his one and only son to die on the cross for our sins. When Jeannie and I, Audrey's daughter, got engaged, I could have bought a $199 engagement ring. I could have bought a cheap ring. It would not have been a good idea. Because I loved her so much, I wanted to get her the best ring that a poor first-year pastor could afford. And so I got her the best ring that I could get. That's what God did for us. He gave us his very best when he gave us Jesus Christ, the proof of his love. And we see the promise of his love, that everyone who believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And the word believe doesn't just mean to believe something intellectually in your head. It refers to total dependence and reliance on the Son of God to get you to where you need to be with the people of God in heaven in eternal life. Some people remember the exact day or hour or moment when they accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior. Other people don't remember the day or the hour. They just know they've loved God and loved Jesus as far back as anybody can remember. And I think that second truth was true about Audrey Stecker. 
She was born in 1935 and grew up in Stockbridge, but attended and graduated Hilbert High School. She married Hermie Stecker in 1954. She had a strong faith and a love for Jesus that she and Hermie shared with the family. Their home was filled with so much love. Audrey was such a wonderful homemaker. She loved canning pickles and going to rummage sales with her friends, shopping, reading, and attending the children and grandchildren's sporting events and Christmas concerts and plays and choir performances. And she served joyfully as a member of Peace Church at Vacation Bible School and Gospel Fest and the Afternoon Women's Circle and funeral suppers. She was employed as our church custodian with 20 years, assisted by her husband, Hermie. I knew the routine. She would get up, at, she would be here actually by 6.30 on Monday mornings, and she and Hermie would steadily work until about 9.30, and then they went home for a late brunch. I don't know if they had breakfast before the church, and this was their second breakfast. I can't remember that part, but they would have a brunch at 9.30. Sometimes I'd pop in and get myself a second breakfast. And then they'd come back to church and work until about noon or 12.30, and then they were done for the day. And one thing you got to know about Audrey, she hates dirt. <laughs> she is the enemy of all dirt and clutter. And if she saw something out of place, that was no good. She put that thing back in its place. And she was a re recycler before it was in vogue to recycle. Even before the church had a recycling bin, she would gather up the recyclables and take them home and recycle them in her own bin. Audrey loved the Lord and she raised her children to do the same. And she loved coming to church. Even Monday morning, she was looking forward to the next worship service on Sunday. And Audrey loved having us over for meals. It was impossible to go to the Stecker house and not have a full belly by the time you were done because that table was filled from one end to the other with all sorts of delectable dishes. And for some reason, I'm remembering the side dishes even more than the entrees. I think it's because a lot of the guys did the steaks and the brats and the burgers on the grill. And Audrey had all these wonderful side di dishes, the cabbage oriental salad and the hand-shucked corn and cookies and what we call grandma bars, kind of like chocolate covered over Rice Krispie types. It was just really good. If you left hungry, it was your fault, or you were sick, or you were just dumb, <laughs> because there was plenty to eat for everybody. And she liked going fishing once in a while with Hermie. I remember, Hermie, that you and I and Audrey went fishing one time on Bullhead Lake, and you and I couldn't catch a fish if our lives depended on it, and you were furiously changing the bait to try to have the best luck with where we were. And what was Audrey doing? She was catching fish left and right. <laughs> Only reason why we had fish for lunch was because of Audrey that day. <laughs> but she enjoyed that. And she and Hermie were such a, a loving, Christ-centered couple. They loved to be together. Sometimes the kids would go to bed at night and they can hear mom and dad laughing in the next room. They shared a spark and an intimacy and an affection and a respect that was envious. Audrey experienced God's love through Jesus Christ. But she also experienced God's love in her marriage with Hermie. She loved and served him, and he loved and served her for 64 years. For better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. Now I'm starting to cry. <laughs> in sickness and in health. To love and to cherish until we are parted by death. You know, you say those words on the day you get married. And you're not always thinking about them. You're thinking about the joy and the excitement of the day and the ecstasy of imagining your future together. But those words take on a richer, deeper, tender meaning as the years go by. 
Your wife gets dementia. She doesn't always remember who you are. She says things that you never thought you would ever hear her say. She does things you would never think that she would ever do. And it's difficult. You're not expecting it. But Hermie was by her side every single day. He never stopped loving her, never stopped caring about her, never stopped holding her hand. He kissed her goodnight every night. They loved each other. Alzheimer's couldn't stop it. Dementia couldn't stop it. Disability couldn't stop it. Disease couldn't stop it. The occasional squabble over something insignificant couldn't stop it. They loved each other till death do us part. They modeled what lifelong love looks like for the rest of us. That's how you do it. You stick with each other. You serve each other and love each other till God calls you home. As for me, I not only married a wonderful, beautiful, godly woman, I could not have asked for a better mother-in-law and a father-in-law. My grandpa always said that when I married Jeannie and into her family, I hit a grand slam home run and a bases loaded triple. That's seven RBIs. That's a Hall of Fame day. And he was absolutely right. Years ago, we had our church picnics in the parking lot, if you can believe that. We would go right outside the side door. There'd be tables set up, and the guys would have the grills going, and we'd be eating outside, and Jeannie and I were sitting at a table getting to know each other. And I saw Audrey out of the corner of my eye looking at us, and she went, <sighs> That was all I needed <laughs> to move in. Well, not I needed Hermes support. <laughs> I appreciated that about her. How many of you know Audrey loved to laugh? So many times we'd be at the Stucker house, and Audrey would be in the kitchen with her daughters, and they would just start giggling and laughing and laughing. And we're sitting in the living room, and we're laughing just because they're laughing, even though we have no idea what they're laughing about. <laughs> and I'm so thankful that Audrey passed on that love of life and love of laughter down to us, her family. Audrey used to laugh at my joke. She made me feel like I was funny, even when no one else thought that way. <laughs> But all of her life experiences flow like a stream from one life-altering, transforming truth. Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Jesus Christ is the one who made Audrey such a sweet and spunky woman. Jesus Christ is the one that gave her a love for God and a love for family and a love for serving people. And Jesus Christ who is the one who gave her the assurance of eternal life with Him. Do you know Jesus? Do you have a relationship with God? If today was the day you were to take your last breath, where would you go? How would you know? You may be thinking, Pastor Mark, I, I received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, but I still struggle with doubt. I still don't know for sure if I deserve to go to heaven. We need to take another look at John 3.16. How do we know that God loves us? He gave us His one and only Son. What is true for the people who have trusted in Christ and Christ alone for eternal life? They will not perish but have eternal life. 
If you have personally received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, if you have repented of your sin and turned to Him, then the Word of God says you have eternal life. Don't let the devil tell you you're not good enough. Don't let the devil tell you you're not strong enough. Don't let the devil tell you you're not religiously active enough. Don't let the devil tell you you're not worthy enough. Jesus says everyone who believes in me will not perish, but have everlasting life. And when you have put your faith and trust and security in Christ and Christ alone, like Audrey, I, can, I challenge and encourage you to get involved in a local church where you can learn more about Christ, more about serving Christ, more about how to encourage the people of Christ. Go to a church that preaches the Word of God and does not turn aside to the right or to the left the uncompromising truth of God's Word. Give your life to the one who gave his life for you and for Audrey. Jesus loves you. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Amen. Our next song is, take a guess, <laughs> number three. 41, Jesus loves me. We'll remain seated as we sing together. Amen. At this time, we have a spot in our service where we have personal reflections. I'd like to invite forward Whitney Ziegler, granddaughter of Audrey, to read the dash. How do you live your dash? The phrase, live your dash, comes from one of the most popular poems in the world, The Dash by Linda Ellis. It means to be mindful that we're only on this earth for a little while. It means to spend each day with passion and purpose, and to inspire others by living a life of joy, compassion, 
and kindness. The Dash by Linda Ellis. I read of a man who stood to speak at a funeral of a friend. He referred to the dates on the tombstone from the beginning to the end. He noted that first came the date of birth and spoke of the following date with tears. But he said what mattered most of all was the dash between those years. For that dash represents all the time that we spend alive on this earth. And now only those who love them know what that little line is worth. For it matters not how much we own, the cars, the house, the cash. What matters is how we live and love and how we spend our dash. So think about this long and hard. And there's things, are there things that you would like to change? For you never know how much time is left that can still be rearranged. Do you have Kleenex? Kind of drip in here. (laughs) To be less quick to anger and to show appreciation more, and love the people in our lives like we've never loved before. If we treat each other with respect and more often wear a smile, remembering that this special dash might only last a little while. So when your eulogy is being read with your life's actions to rehash, would you be proud of the things they say about how you lived your dash? And Barb Quashus, um, daughter of Audrey Secker. I just want to thank my mom and dad for giving us such a meaningful legacy of faith and love and the things that matter in life. We all have courage, we all have peace, we all know what true joy is because of the example they've given us by introducing us to the love of Christ and then showing that in our family. For that, I'll forever be grateful. And that we have five kids and we all get along through all the ups and downs of the last years. Getting along, there's no fighting. And then to hear people say, your family is just an example of love. That's a legacy that I hope to take and give to my family as well. To share Christ's love, make this world a better place. And now the poem. (laughs) Two Mothers Remembered by Joanne Snow Duncanson. I had two mothers, two mothers I claim, Two different people, yet with the same name. Two separate women, diverse by design. But I love them both because they were both mine. The first was the mother who carried me here, gave birth and nurtured and launched my career. She was the one whose features I bear, complete with the facial expressions I wear. She gave me her love, which follows me yet, along with the examples in life that she set. As I got older, she somehow younger grew, and we'd laugh as just mothers and daughters should do. But then came the time that her mind clouded so, and I sensed that my mother I knew would soon go. So quickly she changed and turned into the other, a stranger who dressed in the clothes of my mother. Oh, she looked the same, at least at arm's length, but now she was the child and I was her strength. We'd come full circle, we women three, my mother the first, the second, and me. And if my own children should come to a day when a new mother comes and the old goes away. 
I'd ask of them nothing that I didn't do. Love both of your mothers as both have loved you. Thanks, Mom. Okay, Audrey's favorite son, Doug Sacker. <laughs> I think that was a typo. Was this supposed to be favorite? Uh, so we're uh, uh, on February 20th, I think three weeks ago today. Um, we're in the hospital. And uh, of course, being in the emergency room now with my sisters about five times now, they're smothers. So they're over, lifting up sheets, taking down sheets, this feeling good, that feeling good, and that feeling, well, Sandy and Jeannie were doing that to mom, and I was sitting at the end of the bed, off to the left, and, and she lost a feeling in her right side, and she finally went like this, I want him. So, <laughs> that's, that's where the favorite comes from. <laughs> but I want to thank you all for coming today. And uh, my mom always did like big meals, so we really hope you can join us at uh, Cobblestone for some, some chicken and tips afterward. Um, she, my mom was a great lady, a special mom and a friend. I just want to share a few things I learned from my, I call her my uh, mama bear now after, I always knew my mom was a strong lady, but uh, watching her the last three weeks here, uh, she was a very tough lady, so hence the mama bear. Our, full, our home was full of lots of love growing up, but uh, if you also have love, you know you also have discipline, so we had a toe of the line. Sometime I thought my parents were going to be pastors because they were, they were good on the laying of the hands, if you know what I mean. <laughs> uh, they knew how to, how to give the old spanking. Uh, and I thought I would have it pretty easy being the fourth sibling and, of course, being the only boy, but uh, that didn't happen. Uh, my mom ran a very clean home, but, boy, yeah, she really loved to clean and was, was really organized. I found that out early in life as a sixth or seventh grader. I haven't been doing a very good job keeping my room cleaned up, so she decided enough was enough one morning. I was waking up, getting ready for another day of school and she comes in my room and she says if you're gonna live like a pig well this is what we're gonna do so she eventually took all my dresser drawers all the clothes is on the floor and uh, she says I'll take you to school after you get these all folded up and get them right back in the in the drawers they should be in <clears throat> so that is a memory that always uh, helped shape me in having a uh, organized life, I guess you could say. My mom was a worker and she loved physical work. She taught me and us uh, to work with gusto. Do it right the first time and have fun doing it, we heard many times. We were always up early and we would get our work done and then we'd go out and have a little fun with the neighbor kids and Potter. And if you, well, you guys know Potter, everyone's your neighbor, so. But uh, we had a lot of, lot of great times here growing up in Potter. We picked a lot of pickles in our early years and made some good money doing so. You know you were in trouble when she would start to follow you in your role. She starts picking where you picked and she shows you the nice two inch pickles that you missed, the ones that are worth the most money and the best for canning. So, uh, Besides cleaning and cooking, mom liked to shop. I remember going to Appleton a lot with her and we would always, uh, for lunch, stop at a fast food place called Mars. I don't know if you remember that branch, but uh, we would always stop there, or Ponderosa. Uh, of course, always going to Appleton meant uh, shopping at Kmart, blue light specials, and uh, of course, I would get a large icy and get the old uh, icy cold headache or whatever that was. Um, when we would have friends over for the night, she would always try to make that person's favorite meal for supper. My mom had the gift of hospitality and would always welcome our friends. In high school, our place would be a place where my friends would gather. 
she would always have apple turnovers and other desserts to eat while we would goof around downstairs or out in the backyard. My mom was a sharp cookie, hard to pull the wool over her eyes. Back in sophomore, me and Scotty Manlick uh, picked me up. We're going to go to Kevin Marks, be home by 10.30. Mom, see you at church in the morning. And Scott had a bad muffler that day, so his car was really loud. Well, we were coming home at 12.30. So being the smart sophomore as we were, at when we hit grits, we're going to turn off the car. We're going to coast through, start our bark back up at uh, Winrose and uh, get to church the next morning. We're sitting down, and she gives me a nice job getting home at 10.30 last night. So uh, she knew what was going on. My mom loved her time working at Psalms Banquet Hall. And Betty and the girls were here last night. You want to see fun in action, it was in that kitchen. It was loud, and there always was a bunch of laughing going on in there. Those girls worked hard, and they were very good at their craft. Such tasty food. Of course, I couldn't wait till she would get home because she would always bring leftover chicken and or fish if it was a Friday night. We would snack a bit, and on Saturday nights, we would have a great time watching the old AWA wrestling. And then sometimes, we would watch Benny Hill. I don't know if you remember that show. But boy, did we laugh and shared a lot of uh, Saturday nights together. In the late 80s, I went through a time of depression and anxiety. My mom was always there for us. She always fresh fruit, come over for dinner, but she was always willing to help out. My mom, also a reader, books and newspapers. She was committed to reading the Bible and doing her personal study. My dad was the spiritual leader of our home, but my mom led in a more quiet way. I still remember back in 1996 when my dad was diagnosed with prostate cancer. I did a lot of reading about that type of cancer on the internet back then, and even dad's surgeon, Dr. Chelsky, was impressed with my knowledge on the subject. While dad was just going in for some preliminary chest scans before surgery, well, those scans came back and his lungs were very cloudy and there was something going on in there. Doc didn't know what it quite was, but Dad was put on some medication to see if things would, cl things would clear up. Of course, I thought the worst right away, and that was that he was full of cancer. That was probably the worst night of my life. Well, I tried to call my mom the next morning. I think she was on the phone with Janice Marks. And I want to apologize if the Stuckies are here, our next door neighbors, because we were party line and my mom owned that phone. So. Uh, I think they had to wait a lot till Audrey was done. Uh, I finally get a hold of my mom. It had to be like an hour, hour and a half. And she was laughing and all giddy. And I'm like, how can you be so happy when dad may be full of cancer? I was, I was ticked. She says, oh, Dougie. Don't let that devil bring you down with bad thoughts. We will leave this. <laughs> we will leave this up to the Lord and everything will be okay. And that memory has always been ingrained in my head. <sighs> to keep the faith and to keep on trusting in the Lord, no matter what trial or trials you may be going through. My mom had her rummage sale buddies, Evie, Weeding, Vera Casper, Gloria Duco. Boy, did they go out and have fun and did a lot of negotiating, I'm sure. We found out when the family started cleaning out the home and getting the house ready for sale. She must have had over 100 vases. I'm not sure why vases, but I guess you can never have enough of them. Uh, my mom loved to uh, host rummage sales. We had many rummage sales through the years. And then she started getting the kids involved, having rummage sales at their ho homes. Boy, she would get excited the week of Potterama. <laughs> mom would sell many of her pickles back then and was usually sold out the first 30 minutes of the sale. Hundreds of jars of canned pickles out the door. She took a lot of pride in that. I said, Mom, 
Do you think maybe you should raise the price a little bit? Make, make a few more bucks? And even though my mom was a very thrifty woman, she would say, it's not about that. My mom and dad loved to watch the kids. Even if it was for a night, they loved rolling around on the floor and singing songs with the kids. They'd also t tape all those events. I think mom was the taper. And we have many special memories of all the times they spent with our kids. Of course, mom lived the last eight years of her life with dementia. And I remember we would chuckle early on, giving dad crap on why so many dents were in the van. Dad wouldn't say much, but just grin. Well, we would eventually see the changes that mom experienced over those years. One special moment I will never forget was in the end of December. I got together with Sky to watch some football bowl games, college games, and to catch up with him and what's how, what, everything that's happening in his life. We were halfway done with our pizza and I received a call from West Haven. Hey, could you come down? Your mom is a little upset. So I drove down and yes, mom was a little fired up. We got her settled down. I got her in bed with her favorite blanket and I just did what every good son would do. I put on some Alan Jackson gospel songs, laid in bed with her. Put my arm over her belly and rubbed her head. And we just talked. We talked a lot about what heaven will be like. We talked about her parents and dad's parents. And it was just a very cool moment. And then we'd be talking, and she'd go, is dad going out tonight? And I'm going, no, ma, dad's in his room sleeping. Uh, some of her favorite gospel songs would come on, and she would know them word by word. After a while, she just says, okay, you can go now. And I said laughing, okay then. Uh, so I thank my mom for instilling a lot of her traits in me. She was very instrumental in shaping the man I become and becoming. And she have left a great legacy in this family. And we truly admire her dash. Love you. Our closing song, I'll Fly Away. Let us stand together for our...
thank you for being with our family as we've celebrated Audrey Stecker's life. And we want to invite you to join us at Cobblestone for the meal immediately following. We're going to be heading out there shortly. There'll be a gravesite service after that. But for now, I just want you to receive this closing word of grace and benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.